welcome back from Canada. Oop, I've got a shaky camera here. I am on day four of the Movement Disorder Society International Parkinson Congress um, in Vancouver, Canada. Coming to you from uh, Miss Naomi Casero's living room here. She is my lovely host. We just finished breakfast. She made an awesome beet smoothie. Um, so I'm satisfied. We're going to head out and adventure here a little bit um, this afternoon to Granby Island in Vancouver. But I wanted to hop in here real fast, touch base with you guys, see how everybody's doing. And um, let me make sure that I am on Invigorate's page because I don't. Let me hold on. Hey, guys. Making sure I'm on in video. Okay, just making sure that I was on the right Facebook page. Because um, my personal friends probably um, don't really need to hear all about Parkinson's dystonia, which is what we're going to talk about today. So I know I got a lot of questions from you guys about dystonia um, to kind of come to Vancouver and answer questions. So I wanted to do that for you guys today before we head out. So as far as dystonia is concerned for Parkinson's, Dystonia is a whole world in and of itself, and before I get started, I just want to say that if anything became clear while um, I am in Canada about dystonia, um, it's that you, if you have symptoms of dystonia, which we'll talk about here in a second, you really need to be seeing a movement disorder specialist. Um, again, a movement disorder specialist is a specially trained neurologist who can help really parse out what's going on with your neurological symptoms. Parkinson's is a movement disorder, and um, they're just very specialized in knowing the latest treatment options, the most up-to-date research on um, your dystonia, dyskinesia, you know, Parkinson's in general. So um, below this video, I'm gonna post the um, find a practitioner kind of calculator that you can go in and put where you live in the world um, and to see if there's a movement disorder specialist close by because you need one of these on your team. And something else I've been learning about that we are not gonna to cover today is this telemedicine aspect. For people with Parkinson's, it's growing. There are so many um, universities and organizations that are putting together some telemedicine options where you can access a movement disorder specialist online. And I'm gonna be talking about that more later this week, hopefully. Um, but just know that just, just because you don't have someone close by, there may be an option virtually, because technology is amazing, for you to be evaluated by a movement disorder specialist to help you identify what's going on with your dystonia and then how to best treat it. So um, I just, I'm going to hop in here real fast and we're going to go through some of these questions that I got. And if you have more questions about dystonia, just put them in the comment section below. Um, give me a thumbs up, a heart, you know, whatever you're feeling like today if you are um, tuning in. So the first question obviously that has to be answered is what is dystonia? So dystonia is this persistent or intermittent, so it can be constant or fluctuating, uh, muscle contraction causing abnormal and often repetitive movements, postures, or both. So you can have a dystonia that makes you move funny. Um, you can have a, a dystonia, that contraction that makes you kind of twist or both. So Usually those movements are twisting or patterned in some way, and they may resemble a tremor. So often dystonia is initiated or worsened by voluntary movement. So you're going to do active, you're actively doing a task like writing, and you start to get these um, muscle contractions. And the symptoms may, those contractions may go from one muscle to multiple muscles. This is called overflow. So that is generally what dystonia is, and um, that is important for you to recognize if that's going on with you, that's um, a symptom that you should be bringing up to your movement disorder specialist. So as far as who diagnoses and treats dystonia, I just hit on this, but a movement disorder specialist, um, their, their kind of process is to first identify it, so they have this algorithm that helps them identify if it is in fact dystonia, um, then you can go through this process of getting an electrophysiological examination, which is highly recommended to see what muscles are involved. And then the movement disorder specialist would classify it and then would give the recommendation for ways to treat it. 
So again, um, I'm going to post a link below to how to find a movement disorder specialist below this video um, so that you can see if there's someone close by. So the next question is, that I got is where does dystonia come from and you know, what causes dystonia in Parkinson's? And this is a really great question and I am not sure that I've heard the full on answer here in Vancouver. But what we are learning and what we know is that dystonia has a really large genetic component in its development. Um, there are a lot of genes in your DNA that can leave you predisposed to developing something like dystonia. And dystonia and Parkinson's, um, we'll talk about here in a second, you can have dystonia without having Parkinson's and you can have Parkinson's without having dystonia. There are some genes that leave you predisposed to having dystonia with Parkinson's, but then there are some genes that just leave you predisposed to only having Parkinson's or only having dystonia. So something that I want you to take away from that um, point is that there's this concept of epigenetics, and epigenetics just means that your environment influences how your genes end up expressing themselves. So just because you have a genetic predisposition, maybe you have a gene that leaves you predisposed to developing dystonia or Parkinson's or any other health issue for that matter, um, you have the genes, but what you put in your body and the way that you manage your stress and the way that you eat and the way that you think about yourself even, um, mindset, how much stress you have in your life, whether it's physical, mental, toxin, toxic burden, your environment is what pulls the trigger. So the phrase is, your genes load the gun and your environment, everything around you, pulls the trigger. And so if there's anything that you should take home, it's that the way everything you're doing, exercising, eating right, um, taking your supplements, breathing deep, everything that you do like that influences the way your genes express themselves. And, um, you know, keeping that in mind as you go through your day to day, you're not just eating healthy because somebody told you to, you're eating healthy because every time you put something in your mouth, you're either feeding your DNA great things or, you know, encouraging them to potentially express some of these negative symptoms. So where does, so the next question is where does dystonia present with Parkinson's? And dystonia can be very tricky here. So you can have a focal dystonia, which focal, if you think of focal kind of similar to focus, it's on one, one part. So something like that might be um, focal dystonia. You only have uh, maybe a, a dystonia in your neck that makes your head turn. That's, um, that could be a cervical dystonia. There's also generalized dystonia. So you can have dystonia that's maybe in your whole body. You can have hemi dystonia, which hemi means half. So you can maybe just have dystonia on one half of your body. Maybe one arm and one leg has dystonia together. Um, you can also have what's called multifocal dystonia. So multifocus, this might be two places have dystonia. So you might have, um, you know, like a cervical um, dystonia plus maybe some tongue dystonia, those two places. So it's multifocal meaning more than one place. So it can also, you can also have dystonia that's task specific. So two places that um, the presenters talked about was writer's cramp. So maybe you only have that contraction and overflow and cramping in your hand when you're writing. Um, and potentially only when you're playing a musical instrument, something like that. So there can be a variety of places where dystonia can present. Um, next up, the next question I got was, you know, which medications cause dystonia? And I'm not going to hop into this too deeply because it's honestly, it's not my area of expertise, but from what I, from what they were talking about in the, in the workshops and some of the things that I've seen in my practice is that you can have a drug induced dystonia. Um, it can be acute or it can be what's called tardive, or delayed onset. But if you recognize that you take a medication and that your dystonia gets worse, um, you need to be talking to your movement disorder specialist about that symptom because it can be um, you know, addressed by either going off the medication, changing medications. So if you're noticing that you take a medication and things are getting worse and not better, I hope that that would trigger you to talk to your physician because it's not working for you. 
Um, and even if you notice that you start a new medication, but you didn't develop those worsening symptoms until a few weeks later, a few months later, it's still important to talk to your doctor because it can sometimes have a delayed onset of that worsening of symptoms. Okay, so how, this is the fun part, how to treat dystonia. So I'm gonna run through this really fast, and there were some suggestions for treatments of dystonia that um, you might go down depending on what kind of dystonia you have. So with Parkinson's specifically, if you have dystonia, then your doctor is gonna do obviously a trial of L-DOPA to see if you have dopa responsive dystonia. So you take your Parkinson's medication and your dystonia improves, then you have, dis you have um, dopa responsive dystonia. That's wonderful. Um, but you know there is another option if you have a focal dystonia and maybe just in your hand or just in your neck, then Botox is typically the first choice for focal dystonia things like um, blepharospasm, which is just spasming of your eyes, um, cervical dystonia, that's a good option for Botox, upper and lower limb dystonia, so upper limb is your arms, lower limb is your legs, um, and laryngeal dystonia. So I've had a few patients who have um, issues with their kind of spasms in their voice box, and they get the Botox and it helps improve their speech. So know that you can also have um, dystonia in your vocal cords, those are tiny little muscles in there. So um, Botox has been found to be pretty effective with the laryngeal dystonia. They did talk about how some surgical interventions like deep brain stimulation, um, DBS can be really, is typically the first choice for generalized dystonia. And there are some experimental um, studies and um, I guess research going on about transcranial magnetic stimulation. I've never seen that in my practice, but that is in the experimental phases and maybe a surgical option for dystonia um, in the upcoming months or years. One thing they did talk about is rehabilitation and physical therapy. You know, where does that come into play for um, dystonia? And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of research that's being presented about rehabilitation here at this Congress, but um, you know, rehabilitation is an adjunct to all of these other methods. So if you have Botox, you should be also getting rehabilitation to help you re-strengthen, um, kind of re-educate your muscles on um, posture and biomechanics and all that good stuff. So rehabilitation kind of comes hand in hand with these other interventions, whether it's your medication, whether it's your deep brain stimulation, or um, Botox, you know, you need to be seeing a physical therapist so that they can help you use your newfound movement to the best of your abilities. Also, if you have something um, called Camptochormia or Pisa syndrome, rehabilitation is definitely one of the first choices for those postural um, deficits. So it could be your, you know, if you have really, really bad posture or you're leaning to one side, you may have something called Camptochormia or Pisa syndrome. Um, talking to your movement disorder specialist about those things and going to see a physical therapist so they can help you strengthen and stretch and um, get you in better posture and better, better alignment and awareness of where you are in space. And then finally, the two other adjunct treatments they talked about were um, with eye spasms specifically. There's some research to suggest things like, um, they call them clutch glasses or sunglasses or even a headband we've used with some of my clients. Um, Pressure on your temples can potentially be um, a sensory trick, is what they're calling it here. A sensory trick to help you overcome your eye spasms. That might be something worth trying. And then acupuncture for, you know, things that they call it overflow. So when you have muscles that you go into dystonia and you feel like it starts in one part of your maybe hand and it overflows into your, your um, you know, overflows from your fingers to your hand into your arms, they were suggesting that acupuncture might be a good supplement to help you um, kind of calm those muscles down and then obviously pair it with some physical therapy so that you can re-educate those muscles on how to work correctly. Okay, two more questions. One question is, what makes dystonia worse? And the big uh, message from this lecture was that stress in any form can make dystonia worse. Um, it has to do with the chemical pathway in your brain and your body. So minimizing your stress in any way that you can, <clears throat> whether it's exercise, deep breathing. Um, you may notice that 
exercise makes your dystonia worse. Um, and that's a stress on your body. So you need to be working with your physician to help you optimize your medication so that you aren't so debilitated by dystonia when you're working out that you can't exercise. But if you're, you know, doing a lot of stress management, that should help your symptoms calm down just biochemically the way that your, your body responds and your brain responds. So really prioritize reducing your stress. It can help with your dystonia symptoms quite a bit. Okay, and then the last question we have here is just how is dystonia different from Parkinson's? And again, you can have dystonia without having a Parkinson's diagnosis. You can have Parkinson's without having any dystonia. Um, a lot of times, you know, they can overlap. You can have dystonia and Parkinson's. And it just seems like the genetic component is a big contributor to whether or not you have one or the other or a mix of both. So you really need to be working with your movement disorder specialist in any capacity to help you differentiate your treatment options depending on where you are specifically. So I hope that that was helpful for, dy for dystonia. If you have any other questions that maybe I didn't cover that I can reach out to some of my colleagues here, um, I'm happy to answer them. Just put them in the comment section below. And we are, Naomi and I, from uh, Naomi from NeuroFit BC, we're going to go explore today at Granby Island, and then I'm going to plan on coming back to you guys a little bit later today um, to talk about some other topics that I learn about later. So today, actually, I'm headed to a food and gut and Parkinson's workshop, and you all know that that's like one of my favorite things ever. So that, sh that update should come probably tomorrow, but later today, we may be talking about exhaustion and um, some other kind of non-motor signs like blood pressure and um, all that good stuff. So stay tuned for that. I appreciate you all. Share this if you felt like it was helpful. Um, you know, share with friends, family who maybe um, just don't have a lot of access to resources. And of course, if you have any other questions, just post them below. So we will talk soon. All right, bye.